720 here, Big 550, KTRS. Senator Blunt joins us quite often from time to time to check in on things going on in Washington. And this Iranian deal is uh, getting interesting and somewhat confusing. So, Senator Roy Blunt, thanks for joining us and giving us a couple minutes to sort of dissect and try and figure out what's going on with this uh, Iranian deal. Thanks for joining us. Well, I'm glad to be with you, McGraw. Good to, good to talk to you this morning. So, um, in history class, we were taught that the Senate had to confirm treaties that the president negotiates. But in this situation, that's not necessarily true because this isn't necessarily a treaty. Well, you know, obviously that's that's an important question, and the que- and maybe even a more question, important question is why wouldn't it be a treaty? What other uh, nuclear agreement have we ever entered into that wasn't a treaty, uh, and why would you just want to have an agreement here? You know, I signed a letter with uh, Tom Cotton and 45 other uh, members of the Senate that got a lot of attention uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I thought the most interesting reaction to that letter were the Secretary of State, who the next day finally publicly pointed out, you're right, this isn't a treaty which means, by the way, it's not binding on anybody. It's just an agreement. Uh, the president would be bound by it. It's going to be such a good agreement that we assume the next president would be bound by it. But went to great lengths to point out this isn't an agreement that binds the country like a treaty would because they don't want this discussion to be held in public before the Senate. And then the next day, McGraw, the uh, foreign minister of Iran said, you know, in these international discussions like this one, it's really not the law of any country that matters. It's international law. Uh, I, I assume it will have been in every county in Missouri the second time in the last four years. There is not a coffee shop or a courthouse in Missouri where people think that international law is more important than the Constitution. And then the third point was the president's chief of staff about 72 hours after that letter uh, went out to every newspaper in the country uh, said, you know, the president will probably want this approved by the U.N., but won't want it approved by the United States Senate. Uh, and I, I think uh, everybody should be concerned about that uh, because it uh, there, there's got to be a reason that the president doesn't want to go through the normal process of people talking about this agreement that will allow Iran to become a nuclear weapons capable country. So the, the the Senate is debating whether or not to pass a law that would force the Congress to then approve or disapprove any deal with Iran. Is that to, am I reading that correctly? Well, I think that's correct. I think the 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 law that they're talking about Senator Corker, the chairman of the uh, of the Armed Services of, of the Foreign uh, Relations Committee, our, our neighbor from Tennessee, it's a little bit in, in flux trying to see what you could get uh, two-thirds of the Senate to agree to, because the goal here would be not to just put a bill on the president's desk, but then to be sure that you could enforce that with a veto override. But with the, it may be impossible to get there. The, at the end of the day, what may have to happen is put a bill on the president's desk, see if he signs it or not, and if he doesn't, uh, the weight of this bad decision on our part to let this destabilizing thing happen um, actually then is, is clearly on the head of the guy who has decided not to go through a normal constitutional uh, process. But, you know, we may never get to that. I've noticed since the uh, announcement of the framework came out, uh, the Iranians appear to have a much different view of this uh, than uh, the uh, American negotiators do. And uh, the, the religious head of the country uh, has said terrible things about the United States since this agreement uh, was negotiated as well as before, and also has drawn some guidelines that would look like to me surely the president wouldn't give in on yet another thing, though the truth is we've given in on everything so far. Uh, that we said we would insist happen in a different way. It's not happening that way. And I know I'm talking more than letting you ask questions here, but one final point. If you do have a nuclear-capable Iran, what the, there's incredible danger of them having a weapon. There's also the almost uh, certain likelihood that a number of other countries that we've been able to hold off from becoming nuclear weapon countries like Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Egypt will insist that if this dangerous neighbor of theirs 
is going to have this weapon, they're going to have it too. And suddenly the nuclear club gets bigger and much more likely to have something bad happen than it's ever been before. It sounds like, though, and I don't, I don't mean to make a bigger story than it already is, but an agreement with a foreign country, whether or not that's deemed a treaty or not, I mean, it sounds like it's a constitutional crisis, right? I mean, because this is a this is a question of branches of the government arguing over who's got the power, and so on and so forth. It sounds to me like it's almost a constitutional question that has to go to the Supreme Court. Well, I, I think it's clear that the president, over and over again, sees the Congress as just an inconvenience. Uh, the, the the constant, if you don't do this, I'll do it myself. Whether it's uh, regulations that impact the domestic economy or or now another treaty that would uh, not be a treaty because uh, the Senate hasn't approved it. I, I think it just further expands the crisis in our in our position as a world leader. And what we've seen in the last five years is if the United States leaves a, a vacuum in the world, bad things rush to fill that vacuum. It would be great if uh, our friends who share our belief structure and our belief in democracy and freedom would step up and say, you know, the United States really carried a disproportionate load for too long. We're going to do our share now. But that just doesn't happen. And, you know, our NATO allies will barely follow, let alone lead. So there's there's crisis. Uh, uh, there are a number of crises going on here. Uh, and the president's constant disregard for what I believe is the constitutional process of the government is just one of those. Senator Blunt with us for a couple more minutes. We haven't had a chance to talk to you since the uh, Republican Party uh, went through uh, the Tom Schweik suicide and the the debate here back in the state. You're getting ready to run or not run. I'm assuming you're going to run, but you're not going to mention it here. And I need to ask this question so that I can actually get an answer out of you because you're smart enough not to answer the questions you don't want to answer. You answer the questions you want me to ask you, with all due respect. Um, so have have campaigns, Senator, have they gotten, have they crossed the line? Have they gotten too dirty? Uh, would you like to see something else in terms of the way we elect people today because it's just gotten too dirty? Well, yeah, I think everybody in, in politics, particularly if... Uh uh, you've made lots of decisions like I have where you've got a record that, uh, given a proper vetting, you feel real good about, but you know that could easily be distorted. But still, if it was about the record rather than about uh, all kinds of other things, that would be good. But I think to die, to the idea that politics has not always been pretty rough, particularly at these very top levels of the, the governor's race, the Senate, United States Senate, there's a lot at stake. Uh, you know, I'm just reading uh, in the last couple of days uh, a, a biography of John Marshall, which talks about maybe the roughest election we ever had in, in personal terms, which was the election in 1800. So this is not new. And uh, in terms of my friend Tom Schweik, very smart, very capable, did a really good job as state auditor. Uh, but I, I think it's it's dangerous to try to to try to think of what is the rational reason for an irrational decision. You know, somebody takes their own life. There's, uh, there's a, there's a decision. You can't go back and re, redo that, and that's done. I don't know that all of that. You can always find a logical reason for a tragic loss like uh, uh, the loss of Tom's life and the, the ongoing loss to his family uh, every day. Do you think that that ad where they called him a little bug and sort of uh, uh, made people think of him as a Barney Fife when after his physical stature, do you think that ad went too far? You know, it's just it's a it's a tough business, and I, I suspect uh, uh, there there may not be anybody in Missouri politics who's had who has had more ads to run about just them as a person and their character than I have, and I just know those ads are true. And fortunately, the voters always seem to figure out that uh, they're not true either. Uh, and if you're going to do this, you've got to be really prepared to deal with the, uh, the, the challenges and the fact that people will just simply say things that aren't true on the basis uh, that there's a lot at stake. And uh, I don't think that's a rational basis for that, uh, but it's one of, the, one of the ongoing truisms of politics for a long time in the country. 
while we're while we have you, do you think we all? Uh, John Hancock said he said that Tom Schweik was Jewish, but in a good way. Do you think he was saying that in a good way, or do you think he was using it as a way to to troll for people who might think of not voting for someone just because they're Jewish? Well, I think talking about the people's background and character and what that does for them as a candidate, whether you where you went to school, what your where you go to church, all those things are things that have always been talked about. I, I wasn't in any of those discussions with John Hancock, so whether he said that in passing or said that uh, in a terrible way, I, I mean, clearly, uh, I don't know why that would be a problem for anybody who had a family background that in, include uh, Jews in their family to uh, say, well, yes, I'm proud of that. It's part of who I am. I go to the Episcopal Church, which would be uh, which would be uh, Tom Schweik's uh, answer to that, and uh, John Hancock also says once he found that out, he never made the observation again that uh, he thought was true that uh, Tom happened to be uh, Jewish, and what turned out that Tom's grandfather maybe was Jewish, but he wasn't. Senator uh, Senator Roy Blunt, uh, busy time for you. Thanks for checking in. Hey, and, good and to talk to you. you Sometime we'll talk about the uh, first balance, uh, the first budget that the Senate has passed in a long time, and. Uh, we got to go back now and be sure we get the House to agree on a budget that becomes the framework to doing this work in Washington the uh, open and public and challengeable way it should be done. Well, you're always welcome here, Senator. So thanks, okay. thanks for checking See in. You, soon. you got okay. it. Senator Roy Blunt with us here on the Big 550 KTR.